A healthy heart typically beats between 60 and 100 times a minute, hardly worth a second thought for those in good health. But what happens when one of your most vital organs starts giving up on you, especially when a global pandemic has brought life-saving heart transplants to a trickle? Well, you rely on human ingenuity, of course. A casual stroll in the park with their daughter feels like a dream for Alicia and Johan van Veek. Just a few months ago, he was at death's door, struggling to breathe, never mind walk. And the bag he carries is literally keeping him alive. Their nightmare began 10 years ago, when as a young, fit 28-year-old, Johan's heart began to fail. It was, was a big shock. Questions go through your mind. No matter why, what? Weird. Having a six-month-old baby, the only thing that went through my mind was, I'm going to raise her alone. At that stage, there wasn't any hope. The next 10 years of their lives have been a roller coaster, and it's hard to reflect the trauma they've endured. Johan suffered two strokes, organ failure, blood clots, had a pacemaker implanted, and was spending more time in hospital than out. Then, earlier this year, it looked like the end of the road. I came home for lunch, and when I stopped here, they told me, no, I need to go back there. But by then, he was already in a seduced coma. His organs were failing. Did you think it could be the end? To be quite honest with you, yes. The doctor at that time also told me, sorry, I don't think there's anything we can do for you. So, me being me, <laughs> um, I just said, there's no giving up. Putting on a brave face for their child and each other, they prayed for a miracle. Colin Watermay was just 36 years old with a young two-year-old son. When I was diagnosed, my son, I tried to pick him up as usual. But that morning I just couldn't, I was weak, I was out of breath. So I thought something is wrong with my lungs. After three weeks in hospital, he was finally diagnosed. My heart was severely swollen. So, yeah, it was a pretty emotional moment for me and my wife. For nine years, Colin struggled on. Then last year, he contracted COVID and started having seizures. A pacemaker was implanted, but his health didn't improve. You must have wondered if uh, you were going to see your wife and kids again. It's scary, I must say, Derek. The pacemaker for me has triggered the reality of my mortality, you know? Yeah. Every time I feel it in my heart, it would remind me, of, you know, we are mortal beings and we need to savor every moment that we have. In poetry and literature, the heart has been seen as the window to the soul, the universal language of love and connection. But for these men's families, it's taken on a whole new scientific dimension. Both Johan and Colin were in end-stage heart failure. Their only hope was an artificial heart. World-renowned cardiac and transplant surgeon Dr. Vili Kuhn pioneered ventricular assist device implants in South Africa and heads up the only unit in the country able to do this world-class surgery. The heart has to pump strongly like this. It's easy to demonstrate with my hand. If a person has heart failure, the heart only pumps like this. And when it's get critical, the heart only does this, hardly contracting anymore. And you need six liters of blood per minute to stay alive or to have a good quality of life. Now this is the pump. Correct. And that gets implanted into the chest. So it will go into the tip of the heart and it will suck all the blood out and then the blood gets pumped out through this pipe. And this pipe we connect onto the aorta as if the heart was doing it. And the only part that leaves the body is this cable that connects the patient to the actual electricity. Our heartbeat is something that we're largely unaware of, except, of course, when we're exercising with our fitness watches. So it's quite a thing to get your head around when that driving force is actually attached to the outside of your body. The drive line leaves the body through an open wound, which requires dressing every second day. And a little computer measures the blood flow and the status of the batteries. The heart is driven by two batteries, which require charging roughly every seven hours. It must be an uneasy feeling that your life 
to some extent depends on the electricity grid. Yeah, it does. The electricity situation in our country is not very encouraging as well. But I have backup batteries. I have to keep charged. But when I do have a lot of physical activity, it consumes a, a lot of the battery power. What's it like being uh, so dependent on all these devices, Johanna? Yeah, it's actually it's a little bit scary, but yeah. Uh, you get used to it. You get used to it. In a very real situation, and we're not being dramatic here, but there's uh, load shedding in your area in five minutes' time. How will that affect you? What do you have to do? Obviously, you have to um, make sure you have a charged unit. But I bought myself an inverting system, and that's my backup for my battery to charge my batteries. What is quite critical is when you, you change batteries, because you've only got a few seconds then. Yeah, only about 12, 12 seconds. 12 seconds? Yeah. And the weirdest thing is they don't have a pulse or regular heartbeat. Colin. Hi, you are. How's it going? There's a special bond between these two young fathers. Johan had his operation in June and Colin in August. They stayed in touch, comparing notes on their recovery. He was like the pioneer because he got it first. Seeing him coming to my ward, visiting me, at that stage I was also very weak. And he told me that the way I am, he was maybe three times worse. And he can now walk, he can do things he couldn't do before. So that gave me a lot of hope. Artificial or mechanical hearts like this so-called Berlin heart were always regarded as devices used temporarily while the patient waited for a heart transplant. But now mechanical heart surgeries are fast becoming viable long-term options. The new magnetically levitated rotor reduces the risk of blood clots and can last far longer, up to 10 years. Under COVID, heart transplants became impossible because there were no ventilators available to keep organ donors alive and the immune suppressants required for a heart transplant increased their risk of contracting the virus. But even before the pandemic, there weren't enough donors for the number of heart transplants required. They started developing mechanical pumps long before heart transplant research was started. They started this already in the 50s, but the machines were about as big as this room. And then there was another group of people who started looking into heart transplant. Prof. Chris Barnard and that whole group. And eventually the heart transplants won, and then the whole world just went down the heart transplant lane. But the mechanical people continued, and at the moment they're implanting three times as many artificial pumps in the world than heart transplant. Colin, if you were offered a transplant now, would you take it? I would like to put that off for as long as I can. When I get to transplanted heart, I will have to get on immunosuppressant drugs. And in this COVID era, for me, it's too risky. Absolutely. Because with the Alvet, I don't need to do that, yes. Obviously, this is a temporary thing. If a heart should come around, there's possibilities that you can still go for a heart transplant. But I'll worry about that then. <laughs> for now, I'm just oh. saving the moment. Yeah. One major drawback is you can't swim and showering is only possible if the batteries and computer are protected in this special bag. But both Colin and Johan say it's a small price to pay to have their lives back. The technology when it comes to mechanical hearts is advancing all the time. And the vision for the future is that eventually the pump and the battery will be implanted inside the body and the battery charged wirelessly. But for now, the relief of sending these young fathers home to their families is enough for Dr. Kun. Everyone is holding their breaths because there are so many little hurdles. Till he leaves the hospital, and then when that patient comes and he walks in here into the office a week later, and you see the smiles on the family, on the team, then you feel good, yeah. For the first time in five years, Colin can play with his kids. I feel I have a zest for life. Now I can actually plan for the future, yeah. you know, because I see myself in it. Unlike before, I'm healthy, I can work, I can even babysit properly. Because in the past, my wife couldn't really leave me with the kids because we wouldn't know what might happen. The changes have been phenomenal, really.
and Johan can finally take a walk. Dan geef je leven terug en moet in je leven. Je kan weer normaal aangaan. Je kan weer je dagelijkse dagjes gaan doen, gaan rondlopen zonder om uit aasemheid te wees. Het is depressief als je iets wil doen en je hebt die energie om het te doen. Nie. Ik denk eens weer om plannen te kan maken, om weer een vakantie te kan beplannen, om je weet zeker te van goed. Want voor je kan je niet. Zo, so, ik denk voor ons is het dus de kans om te leven. Thank you for watching our stories here online, and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.